Chapter 29, Part 2, The Search for Order in an Era of Limits, and we're talking about the 70s here. Let's go ahead and start with the supplemental lecture, and this is number 15. We'll call this No Nukes. So No Nukes means no nuclear power, no nuclear energy. Uh, we'll talk about our outline here, introduction, environmentalism, gained popularity in the 60s. We talked about that. Nuclear power, it, it came along in that same era, 50s, 60s. And then, of course, the no nukes uh, movement against nuclear power. What were the incidents? The China Syndrome was a movie, a film. Uh, you had an incident at Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, I'm sorry, Fukushima Daiichi, San Onofre. So, again, if it's on the outline, write about it. Make sure you mention something about each one of those. What are some of the positives that came out of the no nukes movement? The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and Earth Day. And, of course, we'll do the relevance at the end. Okay, so environmentalism uh, brought back to light the, the ideals uh, of the 60s and the 60s values, you know, about preservation and conservation of, of the earth, Mother Earth, uh, reaching back all the way to, to Teddy Roosevelt and, and his square deal and his cousin's new deal. Uh, so environmentalism in the 60s was in response to oil spills, overpopulation, and the threat of nuclear war and the threat of nuclear power. <clears throat> More people uh, became concerned with the state of the planet. And it was brought into sharp review with the, in, with the accident at Three Mile Island. So I'm going to talk about this here in a minute. But this was kind of the, the event that started the whole thing. Uh, nuclear power became very popular after the 50s. It was seen as a clean, efficient method of power. And, and would be uh, the perfect way to offset the oil shortage of the 70s. Except for one small problem. A mistake could be deadly to potentially millions. A reactor meltdown would dump deadly radioactive waste into the atmosphere and potentially kill you know, huge amounts of people. So uh, no nukes became the next big issue. Uh, the baby boomers were up in arms and protested. It was just like the good old days. It was like the 60s all over again. We got something to complain about. Uh, the greatest generation, of course, their parents condoned nuclear power as the future. Don't worry about meltdowns. That will never happen. Uh, so a movie came out in this era called The China Syndrome, 1979. Uh, and this, was, uh, this movie was about the potential of this happening and what would happen and what kind of danger uh, that it that would be the result. So what does the China syndrome mean? Well, when when a, when the core melts because it's not getting cooled uh, correctly, uh, the the material inside gets so hot because it's not being cooled that it melts through the containment structure and goes deep into the earth. Uh, so the idea that a nuclear accident or meltdown at a plant would result in nothing stopping it from tunneling its way to the other side of the world or China. Of course, that's ridiculous, but that's the idea. That, that's where the phrase came from. If you, have a, if you have a meltdown, it's going to tunnel all the way through the earth to China. Okay? Uh, but the other side of it, besides, besides going into the earth, it also uh, pushes radioactive material into the atmosphere. So what effect would this have on the environment if we had a, a major meltdown? Uh, let's watch a film here. This is a this is a film clip from this movie, The China Syndrome. Please watch the film, uh, The China Syndrome Turbine Trip, seen with newly composed soundtrack, and then come on back. Okay, but of course nobody worried. Um, the, the Greatest Generation, oh that's ridiculous. It's just a liberal movie, push and push for more nuclear power. So hundreds of plants were in the works to be built, but then it did happen. And this is where, where Three Mile Island comes in. March 28, 1979, a minor, minor cooling system malfunction caused a partial meltdown and damage to one of the reactors. Now, in this case, although it was very frightening at the time, in this case, very little radiation actually was released into the environment due to the surrounding primary containment vessels. So there were no deaths a radiation sickness that had been officially attributed to the meltdown at Three Mile Island. But the accident caused public concern and new plants to be built were deauthorized. So I mentioned them in the last slide. This movie came out only 12 days before this Three Mile Island happened. It was an amazing timing. So for 12 days, people complain, oh, that's nonsense. And then less than two weeks later, it actually happens. Uh, 
So this, this starts the decline in the popularity of nuclear power. Were there any other nuclear meltdowns? Yes, there were. Uh, Chernobyl in Russia, uh, uh, April 26, 1986, uh, became officially the worst incident. This is in the Ukraine. Worst, uh, world's worst nuclear disaster when an explosion in a nuclear power plant unleashed 200 times more radioactivity than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombs combined. 200 times more. This affected forever the lives of 7 million people because the symptoms can take years before they appear. Uh, 30 people were killed instantly by the accident. Uh, it's really hard to tell how many people have died in the last, you know, since, since this happened. What is that, 30, 34, 35, 36 years ago? Uh, it's, it's difficult because cancer is so prevalent in our society today that it's hard to say that the people that died from cancer around Chernobyl died because of the accident. But interestingly, there have been 7,000, that's a lot, 7,000 incidents of thyroid cancer in the Chernobyl area, an unusual and rare type of cancer. So this is a, a rare type of cancer that's not very rare around Chernobyl. So 7,000 incidents. Uh, when it was all said and done, Chernobyl only released 3,000 of the radioactive material that was in the Chernobyl reactor into the atmosphere. The remaining 97% is still contained there today. And the entire community around Chernobyl today is a ghost town. You can't get near this. You've got to have a hazmat suit on and be very careful. The radiation is still leaking out of this, out of this, um, you know, out of these ruins. Uh, now, the, what you're looking at right here, this, this was the main reactor that exploded. Uh, so a meltdown. And the China syndrome happened. It went into the earth and it blew into the sky and it spread everywhere. Uh, since then, they've actually, they actually built a, an elaborate railroad track from maybe half a mile away. And they built this huge lead uh, kind of cover for this whole thing. And then they, they moved it over with the railroad tracks. Um, and they, they have now covered this entire uh, structure here, the way it sits, with this huge lead covering to, to try to keep the radiation at bay. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a short-term fix. They said it might, it might be good for 100 years, but at some point it needs to be dealt with. So they're kind of, it's kind of like, you know, throwing a match in a, in a wastebasket and then putting the wastebasket in the closet. You know, it's, it's going to come back to haunt you, right? Uh, what's the problem? Well, you can't get in there to get the waste because it's so radioactive. You got to get the waste because that's what's creating the radiation. Where, where do you store this waste? In, in the past, they would put them in plastic containers and dump it in the ocean, to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, will those containers deteriorate over years and, and release that waste? That's the fear. How long does waste last? A thousand, thousand years or more? It doesn't go away very quickly. So you've got all these places on the earth with nuclear waste that is not deteriorating and going away. That's 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 of course a big problem with with uh, with nuclear power. Uh, so uh, so with with Chernobyl, uh, the reason why ninety seven percent was contained, uh, it was because of the deteriorating concrete shell that was around it. But again, it's all still there. Um, you know what do we do with it? So this this truly is one of the world's most dangerous ticking bombs. Uh, Chern Chernobyl. Okay, any others? Yes, not that long ago. Uh, powerful earthquake hit Japan, March 11, 2011. Uh, the earthquake was so large that it actually moved the entire main island of, of, Ch of Japan six feet to the east. Now, I don't know if you can relate to that, but if you're sitting down relaxing and suddenly you move six feet over and the whole earth goes with you with your house it's going to create some damage uh that's a huge earthquake uh so that was bad enough but then but then a tsunami came afterward 100 foot waves hit the eastern shore of the island uh wiping it out completely so whatever the earthquake didn't do the tsunami came in and took care of it Let's go to our next film. This is this is pretty uh, pretty amazing film. This is raw footage of the tsunami in Japan, just taken by people that were there. And you see the power of these waves as they come in and just 
utterly destroy the city around it. Please watch the film Tsunami in Japan, heartbreaking compilation, and then come on back. Okay, so pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing, pretty disturbing uh, video to see. Um, unfortunately, there was a there was a nuclear power plant at at Fukushima Daiichi, the northern end of the uh, island of Japan, and when these hundred foot waves hit the coastline, they hit the power plant also. And what happened was the power generators were quickly flooded, which knocked the vital cooling systems offline. Of course, now these now it's not getting cooled so this caused the reactor fuel rods to begin to melt down and leak deadly radiation into the surrounding area so 16 hours into the disaster the fuel rods in one reactor had almost completely melted with the other two close behind this is this is an epic disaster here but it would be another 88 days until the Japanese government admitted that a meltdown had occurred. For almost three months, the Japanese government acted like nothing happened. It's not what you think. Everything's fine. No, that's that's not the, not the case. This was this was an epic disaster. The American government also took an optimistic stance, not to worry, got it under control. But yet, nobody believed that. It goes back to the '60s. You know, do we do we trust the government? Are they being honest with us? In this case, no. In this case, what actually happened was a cloud of nuclear waste came across the Pacific and hit the United States. Now, the government says by the time it got to the United States, it had, the, the, the radiation had dissipated and it wasn't that big of a deal. <clears throat> but if you looked at maps at the time, it looked pretty ominous. And could you escape it? Uh, I talked about, I thought about taking my, my two young daughters at the time to Utah where my sister lived at the time. And I looked at the map, and it, did, it doesn't matter. If you took, took them to the bottom of South America, you, you would have got hit by this. So this, this huge cloud of radiation hit our, hit our coastline. But the government said it, it wasn't dangerous. So who, you know, do we believe them? Uh, <clears throat> Fukushima <clears throat> Daiichi is under an a, uh, incredible uh, kind of cleanup attempt that they, they figure will take 60 to 70 years. Same problem with at, like at Chernobyl. You got all this radiation, all this, you know, uh, uh, waste that's very radioactive. It's still there and it's seeping out and you got to do something with it. But what do you do? So 60 to 70 years before they get this figured out. <clears throat> uh, OK, so this became the worst nuclear disaster since the 1986 Chernobyl incident. <clears throat> what about our own power plant in San Onofre built in 1968? But in 2012, it was found that wear on the plant was premature, and this raised eyebrows. So Barbara Boxer, who, who was she, a California senator, she determined that uh, the power plant was unsafe and posed a danger to the 8 million people living within 50 miles of the plant, including us. Uh, so this, of course, is around a huge amount of population. You've got San Diego County. You got Orange County, you got Los Angeles County. So huge amount of people, 8 million people, you know, living, you know, if this was to melt down, we'd, 8 million people would be in danger. <clears throat> so in 2013, the plant was decommissioned due to the failure of much of its equipment. And San Onofre today is now being dismantled. And of course, they have the same problem. What do we do with this waste material? Uh, some positives that came out of the... Um, no nukes movement, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Uh, this, this forces developers to do an environmental study of their project before they break ground to, to determine what effect uh, is your project going to have on the environment. And some projects have been scrapped because it's going to have a negative effect, so we're not going to let you do this. And the other, the other uh, 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 positive is Earth Day. Where every every uh, every year, you know, 20 million people come together calling for a safer planet. <clears throat> okay, to end the lecture, here is the relevance. Nuclear power had an extremely dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue, and the state of the environment became important to people. So nuclear power is in serious decline today. One more time, relevance. Nuclear power had an extremely dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power <clears throat> brought awareness to this issue, and the state of the environment became important to people, 
So nuclear power is in serious decline today. Okay. Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number 15, no nukes. Okay, when we started this class, early in the class, we talked about the Industrial Revolution and how this, you know, industrialism became the, became the big thing and, and that was the future and we kind of ushered in who we are today. But, but today we're dealing with de-industrialization. So, so what is that? It's the opposite. It's where, it, you know, industry declines. Why is it declining? Because overseas competition and cheap labor overseas ca uh, cause many American industries to end. You, you can't compete. Steel, especially after, after decades of production, uh, came to an end. And plants are sitting there empty like this. If you go to, if you go to these manufacturing towns like like Pittsburgh and Chicago and, and Baltimore, you, you see these these old factories just sitting there in ruins. Uh, and this became known as the Rust Belt now, because like I said, when you go through these mostly northeastern cities, you've got these these factories everywhere just rusting away. Nobody's working there. They're all deserted. People out of work. So again, the 70s was depressing on many levels. Okay, so back to politics. So, so even after Nixon's missteps with with Watergate, it, it, he, there was a there was a moment there where Jimmy Carter was elected in response that nobody wanted a Republican, but didn't last very long. Conservative politics continued. The surge to conservatism continued. The liberalism of the Democratic Party did not gain because of it. And conservatism really continues until Barack Obama in our in our you know uh, era today. I, I mentioned before about Bill Clinton being an exception, but he was somewhat of a of a um, you know conservative uh, made conservative decisions, even though a liberal. What about civil rights? The interest mostly waned after the '60s, and, and partly because there had been so many gains. Uh, what is affirmative action? Uh, th this is something that was very uh, controversy in its day. So affirmative action is a program that was designed to consider the disadvantages that minority groups and women had had gone through, you know, discrimination, and then try to create an advantage for them because they'd been held back. So positions were set aside for minorities in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, applying to colleges, businesses, and you have what was called a quota system. We're, we're going to hire 10 people, but half of them have to be minorities to, to give them a chance, okay, because they, they, their chance was taken away from them in the past. Uh, but this, of course, caused huge controversy because is this reverse discrimination? Uh, is, is a white person being discriminated against and, and passed over even though more, quali more qualified? So interesting idea. Uh, let's go ahead and watch a film here. Please watch the film Affirmative Action, Crash Course, Government and Politics, and then come on back. So so why affirmative action? Well, you know, the, the idea, I think, was a good one. I mean, it, it meant well. I, I don't know if it was put together in, in the best possible fashion. It ultimately kind of fell apart. But uh, progressive nations want to follow positive discrimination okay you're trying to be progressive here and 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 be fair and equal to all the all the citizens in your country uh democratic process of development with just and equitable growth well we hope so anyway but most importantly number three to provide employment opportunities to the marginalized for their economic liberalization marginalized means oppressed held back because of the color of your skin because of your gender uh, this is, and we've, we've learned about this. This, this, this is a major theme throughout American history. Okay. Uh, so this was an attempt to, to level the playing field for the marginalized and oppressed and give them a fair chance to compete, uh, to partner with building an inclusive society, you know, building a society that, that is mixed where it's not just all white men having all the work. Okay. <clears throat> uh, but it backfires, uh, a man named uh, Alan Alan Bakke, um, in, in this very famous case, Bakke versus the University of California. So, uh, so the UC system, University of California, argued that their admissions program was built to give all individuals an equal opportunity 
while trying to create a diverse student body. But Alan Bakke argued that his rights had been violated because lower qualified minorities were accepted over him. And he declared that this right violated the Equal Protection Act and the Civil Rights Act. Uh, <clears throat> So it brought this system into question, especially the quota system that called for certain numbers of minorities to be admitted to colleges and jobs. Uh, so again, happening in employment and college entrance, uh, the system was called into question and was finally prohibited in California. So, you know, what do you think about this? I mean, this was a, a, a real attempt to try to level the playing field for people that never got that chance before. Now you can, but it backfired. Uh, you know, people argue that this is reparations, where, you know, reparations meaning to to give the formerly oppressed some sort of advantage because they were formerly oppressed. But people don't like that and fought against it. And this this was finally dismantled. OK, also in the 70s, the Equal Rights Amendment gets gets kind of new life, you know, breathe into it. And this is to give women the same rights as men in all aspects of society. <clears throat> The equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So even today, as we speak, the Constitution does not say anywhere that women have the same rights as men. Uh, so this was a push here. This, this is a, an absolute you know, result of the 60s liberalism and people pushing for civil rights, equal rights, and women grab the torch and fight for their rights. Uh, <clears throat> But, but even in the 1970s, many wanted women to remain in their traditional roles in the home. Most men just, you know, let's keep the status quo. We work, you stay at home, raise kids. Uh, and you have, um, you know, people speak, speak out about this, including women. Phyllis Schlafly, uh, one of the more popular or important, uh, you know, uh, uh, opponents of ERA. So a woman against equal rights for women. The feminist movement is just not compatible with happiness. They are not for equality. They want to kill everything masculine. So Phyllis Schlafly lashes out about this. Betty Friedan, who we talked about, we did a supplemental lecture with, um, Betty Friedan was a proponent of ERA and was for it. <clears throat> this came very close to being ratified but narrowly missed becoming an amendment as late as 1982 and still sits there really kind of undone. Uh, let's watch our next film. Uh, this is a very interesting debate between Phyllis Schlafly, the conservative anti-ERA, versus Betty Friedan, uh, the member the woman who wrote The Feminine Mystique, and of course a liberal. They, they go at it here. So please watch the film entitled Phyllis Schlafly Debates Betty Friedan on ERA. Now the film will say 23 minutes and 57 seconds long, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. Just watch it and stop at 12 minutes and 15 seconds, okay? Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, another controversial issue of this era, the 70s, is Roe v. Wade. We still talk about Roe v. Wade uh, today. When Donald Trump became president in 2016, he vowed to overturn this, which would mean that abortion would not be legal in, in, in America. Um, when was it legalized? 1973, Roe v. Wade. Uh, very... Uh, so in the early 1960s, abortion was illegal. You couldn't get an abortion, and you, you had to get it in the back alley somewhere. And, of course, many women suffered infections and death because of, you know, these questionable doctors doing these, these procedures. But this landmark case, Roe v. Wade, determined that it was legal in the first trimester to, to, for women to have an abortion, and it was protected by rights to privacy, including an underage girl, who didn't have to tell her parents that she got an abortion. She could go to a clinic that gave abortions. And, and because of the privacy part of this, she didn't have to tell her parents. Uh, let's go ahead and watch our next film. Please watch the film Roe v. Wade Abortion. Uh, and, then, and then come on back. Okay, so Roe v. Wade made it a woman's choice. Was that the end of it? No, it still rages today. Religious aspects, thoughts about birth control, you know, we've got all kinds of issues here, and we see this a lot. And, you know, abortion clinics are still, you know, protested outside of, and demonstrations go on. So um, interesting, interesting point of view that still goes on. You, What do you think about this? Every, in a typical classroom, it's probably split 50-50, pro-life, pro-choice. So interestingly. Uh, 
So because of all this and 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 this cons this kind of conservative uh, surge, uh, you you have a conservative backlash, and uh, the conservative politics mixes religion into it, and you have the return of evangelism mixing religion with politics, and you have this idea called family values. So the, I mean it sounds nice, but the issue really is is Politics, according to the Constitution, is is not supposed to mix religion into anything. Religion is supposed to be separate. It's a secular country that allows freedom of religion, so anybody can practice whatever whatever they want to practice. But the state and the government should not, in, you know, endorse or condone any religion uh, for their own gain. And of course, the government can't decide that, you know, one day, uh, you know, a certain religion is going to be the state religion that everybody has to follow. That was a, another reason why the people left Europe. We don't want to be like that. But in this era, conservative politics starts to mix it. Okay, even, even though the Constitution, the First Amendment, talks about the separation of church and state, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So, so technically... A political candidate shouldn't talk about his or her religion at all. It shouldn't be an issue because that's not what, how we judge people in America. But yet, yet they do it all the time. Uh, we remember Donald Trump walking, walking down the street and and tear gassing the, the demonstrators while he had a Bible in his hand and walked up to a church and held the Bible up. It, the Bible was upside down, by the way. But you know, a, a blatant attempt to try to, you know, connect himself to the Bible. Which, of course, why does he want to do that? Get some votes. You know, Christian people think he's he's for us and vote and votes for him. Uh, so family values and this whole idea starts in this in this surge to conservatism starts in this in the 70s uh, and, and through the 80s um, and continues on to today. Uh, interestingly, this this family values kind of reaches a zenith. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit here just to kind of give you an idea how far this went. Uh, Vice President Dan Quayle, the, the vice president under George Bush Sr. Now, you look at the image of Dan Quayle, pretty handsome guy. It might make you think of John Kennedy, which, of course, was a big deal. You know, the Democrats had their handsome young guy, and, and they got a lot of mileage out of that. They know that it's a popularity contest for votes. So here comes Dan Quayle, and the Republican Party think, now we've got our Jack Kennedy, and we're going to groom this guy for the future. And the Republican Party put a lot of, you know, hope in the future that he, that he would serve with George Bush for eight years, then then have eight years of his own. You have this long Republican dominated era doesn't quite work out that way. And we're going to talk more about Dan Quayle next chapter also. But I wanted to bring it into this chapter because he, he truly is kind of the the kingpin of, of the family values movement. In 1992, Quayle delivered a family values speech where he chided the popular TV show Murphy Brown. So Murphy Brown, you see in the right, Candace Bergen was the actress. Uh, this is a fictional show about a 40-year-old 40 40 year something woman. She's a divorced news anchor uh, on this CBS sitcom. And she's and she decides to become a single mother. She has she decides to have a child out of marriage. So she's she's balancing raising a child and being a news anchor. And that's that's the show. And Dan Quayle responds to to a TV show and, and makes this comment. Uh, bearing babies irresponsibly is simply wrong. Failing to support children when his father is wrong. We must be unequivocal about this. It doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, highly paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. So, you know, uh, women across America take exception to this uh, hugely and, and lash back incredibly. Who are you to tell me what my choices are? You're the vice president, so what? I'm a woman who makes money. And I don't need a husband. I can raise this child on my own. That's my choice. You know, or, of course, later with same-sex marriage, it's the same thing. I'm choosing to raise my family with two women instead of a man and a woman. So all these things are connected. But, you know, the, the anger of American women nationwide is unleashed on Dan Quayle. 
uh, and it backfires on him hugely to the point where in the TV show, Murphy Brown lashes out about Dan Quayle, even though Murphy Brown wasn't even a real person. It was a character. Uh, let's watch our next film. Please watch the film Murphy Brown versus Vice President Dan Quayle. Okay, so Quayle's, Quayle's argument that Brown was sending the wrong message, that single parentage should not be encouraged, this erupted into a major campaign controversy. And as we'll see next chapter, for Dan Quayle, uh, this, coupled with some other incidents, really kind of destroyed his chance for a future, and the Republican Party's new Jack Kennedy kind of kind of fell apart. And we're gonna we're gonna look at a couple here. Um, the first one is so we're gonna watch two films. Please watch the film entitled "How to Lose the Presidency." Dan Quayle misspells potato, and then go ahead and watch the second one. Iconic year no Jack Kennedy debate moment. So Dan Quayle misspells potato. He's the vice president, and like they do, they go to a school. You know, they 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 make an appearance at a school, and they're sitting with the school while they're having a spelling test. And one one boy goes up and and spells potato on the board, and the vice president and he spells it P-O-T-A-T-O -T -T correctly. The vice president says, "Oh no, I'm sorry, son. That's not correct. You, potato has an e at the end." Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, if you if you uh, have more than one potato, it's potatoes with the es, but not an e, not just an e. One potato has an o at the end, not an oe. So of course he's the vice president. You can't spell potato. This is a pretty embarrassing moment for him, and these will continue to 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 happen. Uh, the second one is uh, you know Jack Kennedy is where he tries to uh, compare himself to Jack Kennedy. And, of course, the response to the man he's debating is, is pretty classic. So go ahead and watch those two films. <clears throat> okay, so, so Dan Quayle's coming undone, and we'll see more about him next chapter. So the religious right, the, the rise of the religious right, uh, is part of this 70s kind of, kind of turning your back on the values of the 60s. And this has continued through the 80s, 90s, and into the, into the new millennium. Uh, it, it wasn't so much that, that laws were made, but, but conservative politicians used family values and a return to religion, even though the Constitution says don't do that. They, they do that as a vehicle to get votes. Is this right? Is, is this, should this be accepted by us as citizens? The Republican Party today has become the party of family values, especially in this era. And, and the start of what's called the religious right or the Christian right, uh, this you know ultra conservative point of view, uh, which we'll talk about more here in the next chapter, chapter thirty, and then one more chapter and you're done, chapter thirty one. Okay, that is the end of uh, chapter twenty nine. Thank you.